Afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting in just a minute, letting the rest of the crowd gather here, but we really appreciate your attendance today at our webinar on building effective small transit boards of directors. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Bogren. I'm the executive director here at the Community Transportation Association of America. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to a first for our association, which is a, uh, a two day series of webinars and workshops for our members, board members. Um, uh, uh, this is gonna be a, uh, uh, I think a, a lot of really good content shared with you, and uh, I'm going to go over some kind of ground rules, I guess we'll call them. This, this session is going to be in a webinar mode, um, so all participants will be muted. Um, please feel free to put your questions into the chat box, uh, uh, and I'll be monitoring those, and, and I have some of our very capable staff are also going to be monitoring those and we'll be trying to answer those while the presenter is going. Um, and then at the end of each of the sessions, I will um, have some discussions over some of the bigger themes that we saw during that part of the uh, session. Um, and we'll try to base that on, on the questions, but we will try to answer all of the questions. Um, all of these, uh, these today and tomorrow, all of this was being recorded and will be made available directly to our membership. Um, we're gonna post it online as well. Really, um, as we are making our first foray into um, providing this training, um, what, we, what we wanna have is keep this readily available so that for each of you and for all of our members as they um, orient and welcome new board members that they can use these videos and the documents that are attached to these videos as uh, materials to hopefully bring new board members up to speed. Um, the, give you some insights on why we're hosting these uh, sessions. And it's increasingly clear to us that uh, it's critical to have effective boards of directors at our members. And we had often said that in meetings and sessions, but had never done anything to kind of provide the baseline and some of the educational pieces that create that good synergy between a transit system of whatever type it might be and the boards. Um, and, and really over the last year and a half, we've had several members um, where the board at a board meeting, a, the board has been presented with a surprise. And in, in, you know, the older we all get, surprises are almost always bad. And these were bad surprises where a general manager is sharing with the system, uh, the board, hey, we're, we can't make payroll next week. And when you start to work back, we want to provide the skills and the expertise for board members to be able to get ahead of those issues, deal with them, and deal with them effectively. Um, we recognize that we have a breadth of members in our organization, in our 1,200 1, plus members. We've got public agencies that have certain types of boards. We've got nonprofits that have different. We have private sector boards. Um, 
I'm I'm on a board uh, where we are called trustees and not board directors. Um, we recognize that uh, all of you may have a little bit of uniqueness to what you're doing in your locality or some uniqueness, but uh, trust me when I tell you that the sessions that we're providing here today are really designed to cover um, all those varieties. And, and as I mentioned in the chat box, you will definitely be able to ask questions. And I wanna make sure that you get out of this time what you need. Um, uh, so ask those questions and make sure we can get you those answers. For some of you, you may not want to have that question publicly, but it's still a very important question to you. Um, as I turn the, turn the um, control here over, I'll put my email address into that chat box and urge you if you have any questions directly that you'd like dealt with more discreetly to please send those our way and I'll make sure we answer all of those questions. Um, before we get started, here's our schedule today. We are in the intro. Um, Chris Zeilinger is up next. He's going to cover transit funding in the FTA. Uh, Bill McDonald will do transit board governance purposes and practices. Uh, we hope to end a little before six. And then tomorrow, we will pick back up at four o'clock Eastern. Same link that you use to get in here will work. Um, and we're going to be talking about improving board literacy. Kristen Joyner, the current president of the CTA board and someone who does a lot of board training, will be leading that session. And then the second session tomorrow, uh, CTAA's training and certification director, Karen Souza, will be covering succession planning, one of the kind of key actions that a board sometimes has to take. So with that, again, thanks for giving us some of your time and joining us today. And I will turn now, I will stop share and turn the control of this session over to Chris Zeilinger. And uh, while he is loading uh, loading uh, loading up his presentation, I'll, I'll, I'll give an introduction to Chris. Um, I have worked in an office in and around next to Chris for the better part of uh, approaching 33 years. Uh, he started a month after me. Uh, so we, we are from the same general time period. Um, Chris, Chris's expertise and what he brings to our association as an associate director is a passion for nuance and the details that are in all types of federal regs. Um, Chris has worked in communities all around the country on all forms of public transit, starting systems, improving systems, helping systems. He's done, done all that and so much more. And I think for, for those of us on the CTA staff, there are just certain questions we get that only Chris can give us an answer to that we probably uh, too much depend on him. So I'm, 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 I'm pleased to turn the control of the session over to Chris and, and, and welcome Chris. Uh, well, thank you, Scott. Uh, and it is a pleasure and a delight to, to, to be with everyone here today. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just want to let's see here. I think I, yeah, no, this is right. I want to put things in a little bit of context. I find even in the, the bits of time where I've served on boards or, or been close to boards, transportation or otherwise, there's a lot of alphabet soup that's out there and a lot of assumptions that are out there. Uh, and I know, as, as you had said, Scott, that the membership of CTA's organization we are a very diverse lot in terms of the kinds of organizations, the kinds of missions the, that, that agencies have, the funding streams and so forth. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about funding today because one of those key areas that any transit agency has to work with is its funding. And the board members, however you all are structured, uh, have a key role. Part of it is to understand uh, where the funds come from, how they're used, without getting in the weeds. We assume, I'm going to talk a little bit about assumptions here, we assume you have some kind of executive person, a transit manager, a general manager, a director, an executive director, whatever 
you know, he or she, she is called some person, a professional whose job it is to make the transit system run. And you as board members are setting general policy rules, hiring that person, all these things that, that uh, my colleagues will be talking about later today and, and then again tomorrow afternoon. We assume there is that kind of person that you yourself as a board member don't have to ha handle all of the details of the day-to-day -day running of the organization. I'll go off script a little bit and just say, if you as a board member are having to do all of the day-to-day -day details of running your organization, that might be a little bit of a yellow or red flag caution issue, but I'll just park that out there to one side for you all to kind of wonder about. What I'm going to share with you for the next few minutes is talking a little bit about transit funding and the Federal Transit Administration. Almost, but I'll be honest, not all, but almost all of our members at CTA uh, receive some degree of funding from the Federal Transit Administration. There are some, some organizations that don't, but most, almost everyone does. Uh, sometimes that comes to your agency directly, sometimes indirectly. The percentage of your agency's budget that come from FTA funds might be small, it might be very large, it might be huge, but it's there. So you will frequently, or you should frequently be hearing from your, your transit manager, the, the, the letters FTA a, a lot. Um, so a couple of structural things. Uh, in rural areas and in some smaller urban areas and for some smaller specialized organizations that are in major metro areas, uh, your FTA funds uh, probably go through the state or some other intermediary before they come to your organization. So to illustrate what I mean, if your organization is a, is a provider of rural public transportation, yes, you get federal funds, but the, the federal transit funds come to your organization through your state department of transportation. There is no way that a rural transit provider can get their core formula funds directly from FTA. You might get other grants on the side, but your core funding comes through the state. So the state plays a very vital role. I'll be touching on that a few points as, as we keep moving forward. Uh, in larger urban areas, uh, I didn't look to see who all signed up, so I'll just rattle off major metro areas like uh, Des Moines or uh, Shreveport. We have a board member from Shreveport, Louisiana, or places like that that are like where the where the our member organizations a, a the primary urban transit provider in a major urban area. There's actually details about population there where the cutoff points are. They get their funds directly from the Federal Transit Administration. Conversely. If you happen to be a part of a tribal public transportation program run uh, housed within a tribal nation, you probably get your funds directly from FTA, the Federal Transit Administration. But so that's a, a bit of a split. Um, and if you're a small organization that's in a large metro area, for instance, for a while I served on the board of a nonprofit uh, transit provider here in the DC area, they got their federal transit funds through the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, uh, which is a planning body for the DC metro area. So they got their funds indirectly through that path. So there's some different ways that folks get funds. And yes, there's a lot of non-FTA funding that might flow from the federal government into your organization with its own funding streams. But we're gonna talk today about FTA stuff. I'm gonna focus my conversation and my remarks on some FTA funding formula-based funding programs. I'll get into those in a second. But first, I want to mention something that I have heard an awful lot in various ways from a lot of, maybe some of you in the, in the session today, but some of your counterparts at other transit systems boards of directors. Um, if you collect passenger fares, and most public transit agencies collect some passenger fares, that fare box revenue is this tiny, tiny, tiny little sliver of receipts. It is not your core source of revenue. It may be significant. Uh, New York City Transit Authority gets about 40%, 39, 40% of their bus expenses are covered through fare box collections. That's just 40%. And that's an outlier. Most smaller transit systems, fare box receipts cover anywhere from two to maybe eight or nine or sometimes 10% of your revenue, sometimes a little bit more, but it's it's a it may be a noticeable sliver, but it's a sliver. The fare box receipts, the money that's collected in cash fares or their equivalents from your passengers is not the driving force of your budget. It might be a leveraging thing in terms of being able to open up funding opportunities, but it's pretty small and it's 
you should expect it to be small. You should not be worried as a board member that your fare box collections are not huge or not making up a huge portion of your budget. Uh, I'll mention one aside. I've worked with some transit systems where uh, the cost to the agency of collecting and reconciling and depositing and managing that those fare box collections was actually greater than the amount they collected at the fare box. To me, that's not a problem other than maybe an argument for that system to go fare free to save itself some money. But let's talk about Federal Transit Administration funds. Uh, you'll often hear, whether it's from us at CTA or folks from your transit agency or from your state, 53 this, 53 that, 53 whatever. I, I could probably spend an hour going into why it's called 5307 and so forth. I won't do that. But there are some core funding programs that support, one or more of which support almost every public transit agency here in the US. Uh, just rattling off what you can see on your screen, uh, 5307 are formula-based grants from the Federal Transit Administration for public transit in areas, er, census-designated urban areas with populations above 50,000. Uh, sometimes that for the smaller uh, urban areas that those funds may or sometimes don't pass through a state to get to the transit agency in areas with populations over 200, over, over 200,000, those funds go directly to what's called a designated recipient in that urban area, uh, which means that, that that entity has a more direct relationship with FTA as opposed to working through the state. There's always exceptions uh, in states like New York State or Florida. The state DOT has its, is involved at every size of urban and rural public transit system, but some states really have different rules with their larger versus smaller entities. Uh, 5310 is a program formula-based grants to states and urban areas uh, for projects that serve the mobility needs of elders and people with disabilities. Sometimes that's fused with a public transit program. Sometimes those funds go over to uh, primarily not-for-profit or other special service agencies that just focus just on those populations. But in any case, it's federal transit funds. And that's important to recall that those are federal transit funds. 5311, formula-based grants from FTA to the states or DC, Puerto Rico, the other territories uh, as state equivalents, but they go directly from this to the states, not to local recipients for help to support public transit in rural areas. Uh, and then uh, because almost everyone I suspect in this today's session is providing some form of bus, I use the term bus fairly loosely, but we're talking rubber tired vehicles that run on public roads. Everyone here is probably involved with bus related transportation. Uh, 5339 is the major source of grants from FTA for buses and bus facility uh, projects. And those sometimes go directly to a unit of local government, even in a rural area. Sometimes they go through a state, sometimes they go through to an urban public transit system. It's all over the board, but 5339 are for uh, primarily the acquisition of buses and construction of bus facilities. Uh, there's a few things around the edges you can also do. Um, but those are some key programs. There's others out there. Um, there's funds that come from Federal Highway Administration through a program called CMAC that sometimes supports some uh, commuter and local transit operations in areas with air quality problems. There's um, other funds from Federal Highway Administration that often support transit. There's funds that some agencies get from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to support what we would think of as public transit. So these are not the exhaustive list of these and only these can support transit, but they're the most, these are the most common funding streams that transit agencies like your, yours will receive either directly from FTA or through your state Department of Transportation. Now let's think about some of the mechanics of how that works. Uh, again, you as board members, you probably do have to occasionally sign off on things Every state, every agency is different in how this is done, but you're going to be involved at least at the launching, approving a grant or an agreement with a state or signing a, an agreement with FTA if you're a direct recipient of FTA funds. So you'll let your board or your board chair will probably have some involvement here, but that most of the details will be handled by your transit manager. But let's think about a couple things. One, 
like so many public sector funding and even some private sector funding, FTA funds are handled by on a re, typically handled on a reimbursement basis. That means that your transit agency fronts all of the costs. Then at the end of a billing period, your state will reimburse you with the FTA funds it receives, or if you're a direct recipient, FTA will reimburse you for the federal share of funds. But typically, your transit agency has to front the costs. As a board member, this is a good thing to know because it places a financial burden. You don't want to be stuck in a weird spot. I'll just say weird. If you don't have enough funds to cover costs that will eventually be recouped. FTA does not do advanced funding. FTA does not do lines of credit. FTA will reimburse eligible its share of eligible costs after they have been incurred. So you've got a financial management responsibility that, that you as a board and your transit manager have to stay on top of. All right, now to get a little bit into transit weeds a bit, federal transit projects differentiate between operating costs. Those are, to me, this sounds obvious, but I've been talking about this stuff for decades. Operating costs include driver salaries and benefits and basically the cost of having someone drive the bus and things like fuel, oil, consumable things that go that make the bus wheels on the bus go round and round. Those are operating costs. Capital costs, the other major category of federal transit spending are going to be for getting a new bus or major overhaul of an existing bus or getting a bus facility or major renovations to a facility, those types of things. I missed that delineation because typically your transit system will have to break out an operating budget and a capital budget because they're reimbursed at different federal rates. There's some areas that kind of are in a gray zone. There's a sliver of activity that some transit systems do that's called, quote, mobility management that can kind of go either way. So your transit manager might be leveraging a better match rate for your uh, on your system's behalf to go one way versus the other. Uh, some, I'll use the phrase preventive maintenance. It's actually called associated capital maintenance in technical terms, but there's some maintenance-related expenses that, again, can be categorized kind of either way. Uh, there's some other things that kind of are in that gray zone between operating and capital. You need to be sure if your transit manager is doing things that don't seem cut and dried, ask a lot of questions of your manager. Don't assume you know he or she is trying to do something nefarious, just ask questions. There's probably a good answer, but it's good to ask questions. Um, another key thing to think about, which ties into operating versus capital, uh, in general, operating costs, the federal government will cover 50% of your net operating loss. It's an accounting, transit accounting term, but basically 50% of your, mo around 50% of your operating budget, the FTA funds will cover. 80% uh, of your capital funds expenditures, the federal government will cover. This match rate change sometimes in some states, so it's not always 50-50 or 80-20, um, but think of that, the, the bigger big distinctions there. And so then the question is, where does that other 50% come from? Again, think about you as a transit, a, your, your system as a transit agent. It fronts all of the costs and then will eventually get reimbursed 50% of its operating expenses roughly and 80% of its capital expenses as a reimbursement. So where does that money come from? Because some of that's going to be used as the non-federal share or what we will quickly call quote local share of your transit projects. Some of that will come from, in some many cases, your state governments might have some fun, state generated funds they use to help cover a portion of the, of the matching funds. Not every state does that, or they may have their, they'll have their own rules about what can or can't be covered. Um, many times, local governments, cities, counties, what have you, uh, will be providing a significant amount of the local share, uh, presumably. Let's cry. If your transit manager doesn't know where the local match is coming from, you're going to have a problem on your hands. So you've identified these sources. Another major area that is the treatment, the fin treatment of which is unique to FTA programs is in many systems, especially those that are serving uh, particular populations, seniors, people with disabilities, low income populations, um, and in a lot of rural areas, uh, there's a lot of your local match quote, local match will come through contracts or other arrangements your transit agency has with 
uh, entities that need transportation service for their clientele, whether that's older adults that need transportation to get to and from senior centers or congregate meal sites, or the by and large, the hugest, most common thing are uh, individuals that are covered that, that are on Medicaid for one reason or another, and their more or less routine but medic medically necessary transportation will be covered by your state's Medicaid agency. And there will be others. Uh, we've seen trans agencies that have arrangements with private schools or public schools. I'll talk about a key concern there, but it is there's ways to do that. Uh, I've heard of arrangements with local hospitals. I've heard of arrangements with employers where major employers in an area will uh, cover a portion of the cost for getting your system, getting its employees to from their homes to their place of work. So there's a lot of arrangements out there. Uh, the point is your transit system needs to have a stable base of those non-federal funds. Now, you heard me say Medicaid. You heard me talk about social uh, senior services in some communities. There's a few others, some job training things. In FTA programs, those dollars through a service contract are eligible as the quote non-federal share of project cost. That is not double dipping. That is allowed under federal law. Your agency can do that. It is not going skating on thin ice as long as it's following the your your policies and procedures and your states your state transit administering agency or from your state department of transportation and the partner agency, for instance, if it's Medicaid, your state, state Medicaid agency, whatever their rules are, senior services, your, your area agency on aging and state unit on aging, whatever their rules are, as long as the rules are being followed, FTA allows those dollars to be treated as if they were non-federal in nature. This is actually a good thing. This is where a lot of the sustainable financing of local transit programs comes from. Uh, so don't feel like your transit manager is trying to fleece you and the federal government by having a Medicaid arrangement. They're actually doing the, probably doing, and 99 times out of 100, doing the right thing for you, your transit system, and your community. So just wanted to kind of put that reminder because I've encountered some boards that get really surprised by that. They're saying, how can this be, how can this be allowed? It is allowable. Again, if it's as part of an arrangement with an FTA program. So, and if you ever have questions about that, A, talk to your transit manager first, see what they see how they explain it. If you're concerned, talk to your the agencies that fund your transit system, make sure they're okay. Or if you really think this is kind of weird or are, are having a hard time understanding what they're telling you, reach out to one of us here at CTA and we'll explain. Or if we see a problem, we'll say, oh, that doesn't sound good. Um, there are going to be rules. Uh, I have run into so many transit board members that are surprised by the regulatory stuff that falls on their transit system. They're thinking, where did all this stuff come from? I'll spare you the history. I won't go into the details of what these are or how to comply, but yes, there are a lot of rules. Uh, some of them apply no matter what your transit agency is. For instance, uh, no one is allowed to discriminate people on the basis of race or gender or ethnic origin or religion or things like that. Um, so that civil rights stuff, that applies even if you don't take one dime of federal money. I'll chime in to say the Americans with Disabilities Act, the requirement that services be accessible to users with disabilities. That also applies even if you don't get one dime of federal money. That's just a basic civil rights requirement. Uh, there's some things that apply to transportation providers, regardless of where they get their money from. Uh, if you're driving vehicles over a certain size, the driver has to have a commercial driver's license that's issued by the state. Uh, if you're doing transportation of almost any kind, there's going to be federal workplace drug and alcohol testing rules. The details will vary, but there's going to be drug and alcohol testing. There's going to be other employment-related requirements. Uh, you can't employ people that can't that don't have the legal right to work in the United States. So that applies again, just as an employer. Uh, there's gonna be some procurement laws. I can, and I have spent day, day long classes teaching procurement stuff. I'm not doing that right now. There are going to be a lot of very persnickety pr procurement rules that sometimes will catch, your transit manager needs to stay on top of. Otherwise he or she might be imperiling themselves your transit agency and you as an board. So make sure that you're following the right rules because states do their own stuff. 
Uh, I was uh, right before the pandemic doing some training in one state where the state had a lot of very state specific rules that all the transit providers needed to, to follow. Didn't matter what the Fed said, the states had their own twist on stuff. So your manager needs to pay attention to these things. And then FTA has a whole litany of stuff that it layers in, into, in, into everything itself. Uh, national transit database reporting. Two things that I'll mention that are key are charter service. A lot of times a well-intentioned manager or a well-meaning board member says, oh, can't we use our buses to take people to the golf tournament that's in town or to the county fair or to take our seniors to go uh, to the casino that's uh, over in the neighboring state. Closed door service that's not open to the public is considered charter service. It can be done, but there are a lot of rules to follow and you should make sure that your transit manager is understanding and following the applicable rules. Taking seniors to a congregate meal site when anyone else in town can also ride the bus, totally allowable. But taking seniors, taking a bus out of county to take them uh, to go visit the casino over in, in, in uh, Laughlin, Nevada, that's probably gonna be considered a charter and might be hard to pull off legally. School bus, FTA has some very persnickety rules about school bus services, which means that your transit vehicle shouldn't be providing closed door service just to school kids, but there are ways that you can arrange for transportation of children as long as your service is open to everyone else in the community, that's perfectly allowable. So again, these are not black and white issues, but there's just some thorny things there. Uh, there's some other stuff around safety and security and asset management that your manager will tell you about. Uh, just suffice to say that there are a lot of rules and your manager needs to know them. And sometimes a board chair or board president or whatever the person in that rule in, in their board of directors might occasionally be needing to sign off on certifications that the rules are being followed. So you should kind of know what they are before you just sign things. A uh, little reminder, uh, don't ever sign things you don't understand, whether you're a board president or a, tra or a transit executive. There will be reviews, there will be audits. Uh, everyone who's touched federal funds know that the federal government requires anyone who receives federal funds to comply with a single audit act, which requires financial audits on an annual basis. You kind of take that for granted, Anyone who receives funds from any federal agency knows that that federal agency will do stuff like make sure that its rules are being complied with through reviews and audits. Um, so, for instance, in the world of federal transit programs uh, in urban areas, again, I said those are census designated places with populations over 50,000. FDA has a program that it calls triennial, triennial, which means once every three years, routine reviews. They're pretty intense and in depth of the transit agencies. And it feels like they're randomly selected, but there's kind of this rolling schedule of places that FTA does its reviews over a three-year cycle. So your urban transit agencies will get those reviews and audits. Uh, for state managed programs, like in rural areas and other smaller, uh, and the, the rural component of sections 5307 and 5310, the state DOT gets what's called a state management review. Same stuff as what the urban transit systems get, but the review is of the state. What FTA does, I'll just give you a heads up, if you're a transit board member from a rural area, is FTA will um, select, and it will feel random, I'm not sure if it is, they'll select a handful of rural transit systems in that state to go out and see if the state's doing its job. I'll be honest, it's going to feel to the rural transit system like they're being audited, yeah, not really. They're not. It's the state that's on the hook if there's anything that's not being done right, but still it'll feel pretty rigorous, but it won't be an investing. And those are routine. It's like, that's not because anything's anyone's doing anything wrong. Those are just to be expected. Um, sometimes FTA will do special reviews. Um, and this is a case where special is probably not good. It's not bad, but it's not good. Uh, I've got a lister on the screen. If your transit agency is selected for one of those, it, it means that uh, FTA has deemed that transit system to be in some kind of risky category and they want to see. And again, maybe they'll do the review and everything will be explained and no worries. Maybe there'll be some findings that need to be corrected. Maybe there'll be something serious that someone needs to be uh, restricted and no longer allowed to do government service. That's very rare but FTA will be looking at these things. Uh, the safety and drug, drug and alcohol reviews, actually they do some of those on a random basis. So just sometimes you just, 
your number gets called and that's okay. Um, and other federal agencies will also do their own reviews and audits and so forth. So if your agency gets funded through uh, the Administration for Community Living, which is senior services and some programs for people with disabilities, uh, or uh, the Administration for Children and Families, which is a lot of low income oriented programs, or uh, uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service, which is Medicaid, sometimes that's routine, sometimes it's they are looking to investigate. Key thing is anytime your transit system is being in having a review, you as a board member need to know about it. The manager has responsibility to notify you. You'll be asked to attend some meetings uh, and you should ask, don't be shy about asking questions. Like, what are you asking about? What's up? There shouldn't be any surprises. Key thing, like Scott said in his intro, is as a board member, you do not ever want to be surprised by anything especially when it's an outside party that represents the federal government looking at things. Uh, so now I'll just kind of leave that out there. Maybe that's making you nervous. Shouldn't, most of these things are pretty routine, but the key thing is to keep in mind your role as a board member. First of all, neither you, your manager or your transit and your transit agency as a whole don't ever break any laws. That sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised. You should be empowering and trusting your transit manager. You'll be hearing more about this from my colleagues, but if you don't trust your transit manager, there's a problem and that needs to be resolved one way or another. Maybe it's a personality conflict that can be worked through. Maybe there's something that's really challenging that's happening there, whatever. Questions should be asked, try to reach a, try to understand that. You should be expecting the board to be reviewing and adopting policies and key procedures around things. If your transit manager doesn't ask you to do anything other than show up at a meeting, get a report, and then leave, that's a problem. You should actually be, you're, you're the ultimate authorities for policy setting, including financial policies. You should, someone from your board will need to be involved with uh, financial reviews, budgets, audits, that kind of stuff. If you're not involved with your transit system's finances, you should be. Uh, not that, not to micromanage, but you should but you should be involved. You should be always supportive of your transit manager, especially because one of their jobs is to find those local matching funds that you need to draw down your FTA funds. So when the manager says that they're seeking contract opportunities, you should be, make sure it's okay. If it's problematic, say so. But also your other question is, how can we as a board help? Um, or if you can identify sources. So you should be supportive. You should be asking questions. Don't wait till things are about to blow up and explode in your agency's faces. Ask questions when you first things hear things that maybe you're unfamiliar with or that don't quite make sense or that your transit managers maybe not explain in a way that you quite understand. That's not to say anyone's doing anything bad, just ask questions because a board member needs to be um, understanding of what the agency is doing. Um, it, and key thing and a key board rule is that you are always advocating any way that's allowable. I mean, we're not asking you to be lobbyist or things like that, that's a different function, but you should be advocates with a small a of what your transit system is doing. If you're on the board and you don't believe in the mission of your transit system, I'll, I'll let my colleagues later in today and tomorrow explain how to respond to that. We're assuming that the members of boards that oversee transit programs believe in their organization's transit mission, even as they always want to keep making it better and more sustainable. And my final word is sustainability. We don't want to see flash in the pan transit systems that disappear overnight. You should be making sure that your transit system will be an ongoing entity, ongoing service that will grow and serve its community well beyond your, your term as a member of that transit systems board. So I'm gonna leave my contact information there. I have, as my colleagues will attest, paid no attention to what time it is. I, I think there's time for some questions and answers. Uh, so I will let Scott respond with any questions that you might've come to your mind during my presentation. And if you haven't had any questions yet, ask your question in the chat box. Uh, there's also a Q&A box, but put it in the chat box. Uh, and Scott will look at those. And if there's any that come to mind, he will now share them with me. So I'm all ears, Scott.
Hey, Chris, good, thank you. Um, you covered a lot of ground in just the right time, as I knew you would. Um, and to everyone out there, I think we've been struggling with the closed captioning. I think we need to have set that prior, and we don't want to do something that would shut this down. So I, can I give you a, an assurance that tomorrow that will be working and tested and ready to run? Um, uh, and again, apologies uh, for not having that done uh, prior. Um, uh, we have a question. Uh, someone asks, uh, can you please explain in more detail how Medicaid can be used as local match? Uh, Randy's in Vermont. Uh, we know that the state uh, association is managing the state's Medicaid NEMT contract uh, uh, and been told that Medicaid cannot be used as local match. Can you can you have some insights on that, Chris? I will share. A, I don't know if this will be helpful, but I'll share a couple of different things on that. First thing is. If your transit service is funded by the state, then the state gets to set the rules. Good or bad, I'm not gonna be the judge, but the state gets to set the rules. Uh, so it's not uncommon, even when sometimes we all might like to see it done otherwise, where a state will say, I know, the, I know FTA says it's allowable, but that's not how we do it in the state. You might, that might be a long-term thing that your transit system, a state transit association, if it's organized, might want to continue working with the state to refine or address or what have you, but that, that's the thing. Uh, another flip side of that is Medicaid. I know I mentioned it because it is, uh, on a nationwide basis, Medicaid is the largest funder of transit operating costs in the country. Uh, so but that's national, that's not state. Medicaid is really um, 52 different state managed Medicaid programs and every state does things differently. Or one of the things, I'll, I'll go slightly off tangential to your question, sometimes states will change how they do their Medicaid programs. And I've seen one state, I have no idea if it's transit systems are with us where a number of years ago, the state totally one year state legislature told the state Medicaid agency to change how it did their Medicaid transportation in one legislative session, caught everyone in the transit world by surprise. Poof, a lot of funds kind of evaporated from one year to the next. So state Medicaid agencies will also determine where and how their funds can be used for transportation. The fact that the federal government says it's allowable doesn't mean that it is guaranteed to be that way. It just means it's allowed. So there's a lot of nuances there that will vary from state to state. I will now speak to the question in a slightly more general term for any of these federal human services programs is that the idea, at least from the FTA perspective, is that the transit system has entered into an agreement, which means that something should be in writing, whether it's a brokerage agreement with a Medicare and EMT broker or a grant or contract with a state or whatever, an agreement in, in like in Vermont's case through VPTA, there's some kind of document that says that the transit agency will provide transportation for these people under these terms and conditions. Does that sound like a contract? Yeah, it basically is a contract, some kind of agreement. It will be assumed that that contract follows both the transit agency's policies and procedures as well as all the other parties and procedures. Because from the federal perspective, if a state Medicaid agency or its designee has entered into an agreement following its policies and procedures with a transit agency to provide the non-emergency medical transportation, then that's acceptable to all the parties. It's a fairly negotiated, it's a reasonably negotiated contract. Rate setting is entirely, the, it's a, that, that's based on how states do their stuff. So we'll assume that it's all fair and above board. Every now and then someone might get their 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 situation in a pickle because the state didn't quite do things right, but that's a generality. So that's a very general term that also applies to things like Head Start, senior services, uh, vocational rehabilitation, job training, all these things. Like if there's an agreement that is negotiated between the parties according to their policies and procedures, FGA will find it acceptable. The details then remain in the hands of your state and the very state actors involved with that. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna freelance a little here because there was some there's a topic that I think you covered 
53, 07, 10, 11, and, 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 and what those are. And those are formula funding programs, funding that is coming to either a state or to some of our folks directly as part of a formula. Can you give us some insights on how the US census plays into those formulas and where a board member of a system should be looking at their performance of the system, ridership, coverage, where that plays into how much they're getting in formula funds? Well, the, the short answer, and Scott knows that I could spend, and I have spent day-long day sessions talking on this stuff, so I'll keep it real True enough. <laughs> um, the, the, the basic thing is the money is allocated to states and urban areas based on a number of factors that include population is one among many. Interestingly, and this is one of those things that I think comes to a lot of transit board members by surprise, that your the, the number of people taking the bus in your community has very little impact on how much transit money you get. Uh, the formulas, urban and rural, are based on uh, a number of other factors, primarily in uh, smaller urban and in rural areas. It's population for rural areas, it's land area. And I should say that these are the for Area for what I'll loosely call rural areas, the money goes to the state. The state then gets to decide who gets how much under what basis. So the fact that it's formula based on what the state get does not mean that it's formula based on what the rural transit system gets themselves. The states make those choices. The small urban program, and this is a little bit in the weeds, but I'll be real brief. For areas between 50,000 and 200,000, um, Almost all of that funds, all those funds are allocated on the basis of urban areas, populations and population density without, even if there's no transit system. Uh, I'll just name a place because I happened to do some, a little bit of work with them a while back. Um, Valdosta, Georgia from 1964 to 2000. And it was, I think right before the pandemic, I'll say 2020 for, what is it? That's a lot of years, from decades, literally many decades. Valdosta, Georgia, area of about 76,000 population, always got a transit apportionment, and they never for all those decades had a public transit program. Georgia Department of Transportation took those funds with some others for areas that didn't have public transit and redistributed them to other places that did. It wasn't like it stood in a bank vault for decades waiting to be tapped into. So the states get to make some choices there. Um, the for urban areas, uh, I will mention as an outlier because I it was one of the places where I grew up. Uh, so the Los Angeles area um, has the direct recipient is Los Angeles County. There are in the Los Angeles urban area 140 public transit providers. The formula allocation to Los Angeles is based on what all the systems did, but then LA Metro and its and local officials determine how to split those funds up locally. So there's a lot of local decision making in urban areas, a lot of state based decision making in state areas. Uh, every 10 years, census recalibrates what's urban, what's not urban. There are some places that are getting some surprises these days. Uh, and again, I, I did a whole webinar on this for CTA several months ago. Um, I can happily talk offline with anyone who has a question. I'll just pick on one place as an example. Um, Henderson, Kentucky, for several two for 20 years was part of the Evansville, Indiana urban area. So Henderson Area Transit System, one of our members, was a small municipal transit system that happened to be part of a quote large urban area. And they would get their funds as a share of what went to Evansville, Illinois. Well, Illinois, Indiana, Illinois, Indiana, rather. Um, and then in this most recent census. Uh, census decided that the Evansville, Indiana urban area stopped at the state that the Ohio River did not cross into Kentucky. Henderson, Kentucky now has to be a rural public transit provider getting its share of 5311 funds from the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. That creates an interesting challenge, separate topic for a different time, but some there will be some of you that are probably part of transit systems that will be affected in one way or another. It might be good, it might be bad, it might just be different based on some census determinations. Chris, and, and now that we've we've opened the can on <laughs> census, we have a very good question, which says, could you please talk a little bit about census tracts that are underserved and kind of how a board member should be uh, interpreting that? There are a lot of ways you could go there, and I'll keep it fairly simple. 
Um, two things. One is no one is requiring a transit system to provide a route to a place just because people live there. Transit routes, especially a fixed route service, are a precious commodity. And presumably, you've got some expertise that decides the bus runs there. Because the moment the bus runs there, that means it's not going to go over there. So you need to decide where's the bus going to run. Uh, obviously, there's a mission in public transit of serving people that need public transit. That's a decision point to be made. Uh, sometimes that means that areas might, and I know FTA sometimes puts out a definition. I'm not, it's not a legally binding one in my opinion, but that's just my opinion uh, of what an underserved census tract means. It doesn't mean you have to go run a bus out there right now. It does mean that you might get some preferential treatment for a little side pot of money that FTA hands out on a competitive basis for areas of persistent poverty. There might be, it's good to know where the underserved areas in your area are, but you don't have the obligation to serve them. Flip side of that is civil rights. Uh, everyone has to comply with the Civil Rights Act, but in transit, some things are unique. And if you're a transit system that whose bus routes are only serving people of a certain race and not available to people of another race, that's a problem. Even if it was not designed intentionally to be that way, that's a problem. Uh, similarly, if you are, have make transit very inconvenient for people of a certain race and not for others, you got an issue on your hands there. Again, is there a right or wrong answer? I don't know, but there's an issue. So sometimes these things play in in different ways, but everything would be then have to be looked at on a place by place, system by se system um, situation. There's not a one size fits all solution for how to serve the people in America that most need transit. And, and Craig, uh, further to that uh, question, if you need more detail, email me or Chris directly. And uh, as you can tell, uh, Chris can Chris can speak into in more than into the weeds on on census census stuff. Chris, while we're on transit, and I mean that's the first part of this is the baselines for transit for the board members participating. I thought I would I would raise a couple of issues. One. Um, we have the the honor of working with transit systems all over the country. And so we're seeing at CTA trends that you may be seeing at your agencies in your communities. And what are some of those? And I thought I'd raise that, you know, when 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 we're working a, with our members directly at meetings with large groups of our members, for the most part, the two things that are, are top of mind are one, the difficulty finding drivers. That's probably a difficulty at your agency. It's a difficulty nationally. Second is the difficulty and the expense and the time it takes to replace rolling stock and vehicles um, far beyond what we were used to pre-pandemic. Um, those two issues, just for the board members here when we're talking transit, um, whether it's our largest systems, or running fixed routes or our smallest agencies that are doing some demand response for people with disabilities and older adults, those two challenges are ones that we're constantly working on here in DC trying to improve upon, but they're ones that a lot of our systems are seeing. I wanted to share that. Um, Chris, there's a piece too that um, each system, when it pulls down federal funds, there's, a, there's, there's these certifications and assurances that have to be provided to the federal government. Where do you think a board member, how much should a board member know about that? Is that something uh, uh, that they need to be aware of? Where, where does that fall, you think? Oops, I didn't mean to hit that. Um, yeah. Well, for one, yes, there are certifications and assurances. Um, and typically, and again, in a state managed program, the state does that. So for a lot of systems, you might not even be aware that these things are applied. And that's, I would actually say, Scott, that that's the more touchy situation where the, and, and basically for those board members that don't know what we're talking about, uh, it's about 20 pages of, if you printed it out, uh, tiny type, the type, kind of the size of printing that back when we all had telephone books, the phone books were printed in, really fine print very legalistic stuff that says we will, and, and the transit manager, the, the accountable agency executive, transit manager, or for state managed programs, someone from the State Department of Transportation is basically checking the boxes that apply to that entity. It says, we won't do this, we won't do this, we will do this, we agree to this. Lots of fine print. Basically, they are the terms and conditions of federal funding to the transit system. Um, 
And if you ever want to know what they are, you can go to the Federal Transit Administration website. That's transit.dot.gov. Do a search on their website. You actually see all this language. It's it's out there. There's no secrets. Uh, and, and it is. It's a lot of grant related, but agency specific, legalistic language. Uh, basically, I will simplify that to say, go back to that that bullet point. Now that I know how to go back, the first bullet point I had on this slide: don't break any laws. Your transit manager, or for state programs, your state department of transportation has basically agreed to a whole bunch of stuff that says that neither the entity nor its subrecipients are going to break any laws. So you've got a bit of a responsibility as a board member to kind of know what those are. I would say that if your transit manager is taking the time, even though it might feel tedious to them and to you, to explain what you have to comply with, that's time well spent because you don't want to just assume that the federal government doesn't know what they're talking about and they're making these things up. No, they're there. They're all grounded in actual federal statute most of the time. So uh, I would say that there is a duty to inform. I would say that's probably this probably ties more back into what Bill will be sharing with you in a little bit. Um, that the transit manager has a duty to inform you of not just the problems that are arising, but also what do we have to do here? So I'd, I'd put those in that category. And if you're in a system that gets your funds from a, an indirect source, whether it's the State Department of Transportation or your subrecipient, like 142 of those 143 systems in LA, you're a subrecipient to LA Metro uh, for your funds, or you're a 5310 senior services provider, like I was on the board of for a while, that gets their funds from a planning agency. In any case, you need to know that there are rules and what they are that apply to you. So it's it's good to ask some questions, especially if if this is something that we're raising now that you're hearing for the very first time. You might want to just ask the questions and make sure you're comfortable with the answer you get. And if you don't like the answer, then come back to us and say, what's my manager talking about? We'll explain it to you. And then hopefully everything will be fine. Chris, last question. And um, to Craig's comment about how difficult it is on drivers, we're going to include a link to the training that uh, Karen Souza on our team has done. She'll be training tomorrow as part of this, but we've uh, got a video-based presentation on driver recruitment and retention with a lot of great ideas that some of our members have deployed and found useful. We'll sh I think uh, Taylor's gonna be sharing that link shortly. Chris, on, on, on the last question, when we're looking at the, the, the when you s work with agencies like you have all around the country, what do you look for when you say for 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 an effective board from a transit perspective? What I what I keep an eye out for are transit board members first and foremost that know what their agency does. I have visited some places where they they, they show up for meetings. Maybe there's a nice conversation. They get a nice report. Maybe they're asked to vote on a thing or two. They all hands go up. Blah blah blah. And then they all go home and they don't have a, any idea what they were talking about. That's never good. You should know what your agency does. That's number one. You should be curious about what your agency can do better. That's number two. You should be, got to be involved with any major decisions your transit manager is making. Not the minor ones, stay out of those, but you should be involved with the major decisions. Policy get setting, goal setting, uh, executing major agreements with funding sources. Even if you don't have to sign them, you should at least be know, know what they are. Uh, you should be honoring policies and procedures. The biggest problem I've seen with problem-plagued transit systems is when neither the board nor the executive are actually following their own policies and procedures. Sometimes they don't make sense to me as an outsider. There's one agency I'm doing a lot of work with. It's a very high-performing agency, no problems with them. Every single contract has to be signed by a board president at a meeting that they have but once a month. To me, that sounds like a bit much, but it works for them and it's what their policies do. If that's the policy, follow the policy. Don't make your up your own rules because you find the policy awkward. Uh, so taking shortcuts uh, and, and those the others. Um, and ask questions. There's one system I worked with that actually went out of business because they uh, had a lot of negative findings under FTA reviews. Some of them pretty darn serious. And the transit board None of those board members, I went to some of their meetings, they would never ask a question of the manager, even like, oh, 
you, I heard that uh, someone from FTA was going to be in town this week. What's that about? And the board member, uh, the trans manager, I remember I was at a board meeting doing board training, shaking my head in disbelief. The trans manager says, oh, don't worry about that. No, 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 no. worry. I said, worry. And, well, anyway, so those are some of my key thoughts. But I, I'm sure that throughout the, uh, when, when Bill's sharing with you at, right after this, and then again, uh, when you've got uh, Kristen and Karen tomorrow, that's what similar points are going to be from my colleagues as well, is you've got to be engaged. Don't be overbearing. Don't be micromanaging. But by golly, be engaged. Thanks, Chris. That's a great way to uh, end your session. Appreciate your time and expertise. And uh, uh, I'm sure we will we'll be, um, everyone out there, if you have, you saw Chris's email, um, fire questions as uh, you think uh, Chris, Chris can, can handle for you. I'm, while Bill McDonald takes control of the screen and puts his, uh, his session up, I'll introduce Bill. Um, Bill is uh, uh, currently a, a board member at our organization, the Community Transportation Association of America. Uh, twice he served as the chair of our board. Um, Bill is also a current board member of RTS, a uh, mid-sized urban operation in Rochester, New York. Um, prior to that, and, and by the way, those all those things I've been talking about are what Bill has done in his, and I'm going to use very loosely, retirement. Um, prior to that, Bill uh, was the general manager and executive director of medical motor services in, in uh, located in Rochester, New York, doing a lot of um, non-emergency medical transportation. Uh, Bill has worked with the United Way. And uh, on our board, Bill has always been one to remind us about the forms that good governance and good board governance takes. And, and so I couldn't think of a better person to talk about that issue and, and speak to purposes and practices. So welcome, Bill. Uh, the session is yours and, and thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And <clears throat> it's great to be here. Um, I think what you're pointing out is that I'm not very good at retirement, uh, but I keep trying. I did retire actively running an organization transportation agency about seven years ago, but I've been active on boards and governance since then, and also some direct service. I'm proud to say, I think I've been a member of CTA uh, from the very beginning as a charter member, I think in 1989. And so uh, when Scott was talking about Chris and him, how long they've been there, I think I've known them from the very time that they started and Karen as well. So again, uh, thank you for um, having me here. And uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, now I got to, whoops. I gotta figure out how to move this. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so today, uh, the purpose of the presentation uh, to go over is to, some of it's been uh, touched on um, very, very well uh, by Chris earlier, but to really talk about what are the common responsibility and duties of uh, boards, whether they are public or nonprofit. Uh, and there are some differences between the two, but there's enough similarities that, that can share these, uh, the focus and the responsibilities. Um, Primarily, the non-for-profit organizations, voluntary organizations, they're called voluntary organizations because the board is really volunteers versus a private uh, for-profit uh, that whose purpose is really shareholders that they're accountable to and producing profits. And that can be in the transportation sector as well. Uh, but in the nonprofit sector, you have volunteer directors running it. There are no profits that accrue to them. They go back into the operation itself uh, and so that's one of the main distinctions also in terms of the certification by IRS or the state local charities organization uh, that gives them the ability to, to operate. Um, certainly today's transit organizations are very complex and we've talked a little bit about some of those challenges internal and external that are facing them. Uh, and that includes post COVID ridership uh, issues. We're up to about 80% in Rochester from pre COVID. 
uh, demographic changes in a community. You have a larger uh, demographic of older adults that have different mobility needs, perhaps. Uh, there's new mobility options in the community that transit agencies have to collaborate and work with, whether it's you know, the ride share or bike share uh, uh, opportunities that are out there. So there's a lot of uh, things going on in the environment. Uh, also hope to provide some example of practices. There's policies and then there's practices. And I feel pretty uh, strong and proud of the work that's done in Rochester. So I'm gonna be sharing some examples of what we do in the governance area that perhaps you can take with you. And there are some handouts that will be available to you. Um, and then uh, I, I hope to hear a little bit about your ideas or questions that you might have about governance. And really the ultimate goal here is to make all of our boards high functioning collaborative and effective. Um, I thought I'd share uh, just some um, things I've observed about boards over the years. And I've been on, I've been involved in transportation for 40 plus years as an operator, as I mentioned, but also in terms of policy and governance and not just transportation boards, but other boards as well. Boards are, uh, boardrooms are really often filled with people of good intentions. I, I think that's a good starting point. People are there because they wanna make a difference and they believe in it. The competencies, however, of board members can be very varied uh, and you get a lot of different skills. Uh, sometimes they complement each other. Sometimes people uh, are in there for different motivations, but so it's very, very different. Um, I have found that boards tend to uh, go towards the conservative and risk adverse nature of things because they wanna protect the agency. Uh, and I'm not sure that's always a positive thing, especially if you have a CEO as well, that's very risk adverse. Um, I found that boards really don't like to hire and fire CEOs. That's one of those things like when the, when the CEO announces that they're leaving, it's like, oh, you know, they have to go through this whole process. What process are they going to, to use? And that's why we have in our governance uh, responsibilities on the board that I'm on to lay out. And, and Karen's going to talk more about this. What is the succession policies that should be followed <clears throat> so that you know about this ahead of time? A passive board uh, who relies too much on a CEO can be manipulated and that can uh, lead to disasters. As Chris pointed out, on the other hand, meddling boards can really mess things up as well. So the sweet spot is to stay at a high level in terms of policy and practices of governance without getting too much in the weeds, but also being independent. It's good to have turnover and term limits of board members. It's good to have people that have been there with provide some legacy and also to have some fresh and new um, voices on the board. What I've learned about being on a board is you have to be vigilant. You have to insist on reports being tied to metrics. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that and what are some metrics that we use. You need to challenge executives when there are concerns and you need to stay focused on the mission, the vision and the outcomes. Because being on a board is really meaningful, impactful work. And I have always viewed it as a privilege and an honor. And I don't know why I'm in trouble getting to these next <laughs> slides. Um, so why have boards and what's the purpose of governance? I've heard from more than one person uh, who comes from the private sector, especially, and, and becomes a leader in, in a nonprofit board or a public board that they don't really always understand what the purpose of the board is, especially if they're a middle management uh, in a private sector organization. Why are they necessary? They seem like a hassle to deal with. Fundamentally, boards are, in some cases, public boards are mandated by uh, the government. Uh, the Rochester Transit System, for example, is a public benefit corporation and a unit of unit, uh, New York State government. It was created in 1969. It took over because there was a private for-profit company running it and they could no longer sustain themselves. Uh, they weren't able to make a sufficient profit. They weren't able to generate the kind of income that they needed. We actually had a subway in Rochester one time that went defunct in the late uh, 1950s uh, because it couldn't be uh, managed. So uh, the government took it over, the state took it over with the understanding that it's a public benefit and therefore uh, deserving of and, and entitled to public support to make it sustainable. But boards exist to assure that the organization works to achieve its mission. 
In our case, the mission uh, in Rochester Transit is to provide, quote, to provide vital, safe, and sustainable transportation that connects the community and promotes a better quality of life. Well, you know, like many mission statements, how do you measure that? How do you measure that you're promoting a better quality of life, that you're connecting the community? But that tends to be typical of missions. They're very broad and they're aspirational. So uh, secondly, boards work to assure that the entity serves the need and goals of the stakeholders. Now, stakeholders can include ridership, obviously, employees, businesses, schools, and in the case of public entities, for sure, taxpayers and government bodies. Um, when we talk about riders, it's really important, I think, for boards of public transit or even uh, nonprofit transportation organizations to understand who their ridership is uh, and to get data about that. I uh, was surprised to find out uh, when I asked in Rochester, you know, what is the makeup of our ridership besides what I see on the buses? Uh, and we do on bus surveys of riders to get their feedback on the quality of the service, uh, the, the safety of it, the cleanliness of it. And we also get some demographic information. And we found out in a report that the majority uh, of the ridership are young people, not real surprising there, between 18 and 29. But what surprised me is 35% are over the age of 50. And I think a lot of people don't think about older adults riding public transit. They think, oh, they're afraid of public transit and so on. In Rochester, 70, 80% of the ridership is either young adults or older adults. They tend to be poor. Uh, their, their household income is under $15,000 um, for 52% of them. Vast majority reside in the city. Now the Rochester transit system is an eight county system that's made up of both rural and urban. So the board is comprised of members who represent these different areas. But the vast majority of riders are really from the city. The vast majority of riders are non-white. The vast majority of riders use transit to get to work first and then medical second. So as a board member, it's important to know who's using your system, why they're using it, and knowing who uses it uh, helps you understand what some of their needs might be. The third purpose, of course, is to be an efficient steward, uh, an effective steward, too, of the agency's assets and resources. More of these fiduciary responsibilities are going to be covered tomorrow, uh, but I'm going to touch on some of them today as well, provided I can get my slides to move then in a way that I hope I can. Um, the fourth is to increase the public trust and confidence. You know, we as board members represent this uh, entity when we're out in the public. And so we have an obligation to garner public support uh, because in some cases, not, not so much in New York state, but I know in Michigan and other states, the public can actually vote for uh, money through taxes or millages to support public transit. So having uh, a public body that is trustworthy and that the public has confidence in is very uh, paramount and a high performing transit system is gonna justify that kind of support, even though we know that ridership is a challenge and even though we know that recruiting drivers is a challenge, we always wanna have a, a continuous improvement of our service so we get the public's trust, uh, trust. The fifth is assuring the entity's sustainability and Chris mentioned this too. The leadership of a, of a, of a transit organization may change, but the board structure represents a continuation of the corporation and its interests. So boards are responsible to develop strategies to make the transit agency services relevant and to ensure that their operations and management uh, is responsive and competent and that it has the ability to continue um, going forward. Oh, I'm so happy I got that to change uh, without a hassle there, the slide. So first I'm gonna cover the three primary duties of a board member duty of care, duty of loyalty, and duty of oversight. In terms of duty of care, um, it, it can become easy to defer to a strong executive. We get that. <clears throat> Many of us probably know of agencies that have hit a crisis point uh, when they've been surprised by the information that they're getting when it's too late. And sometimes the crisis was too far along to salvage it uh, and maybe cause damage to its reputation. And I, I know Chris touched on this, Scott knows of these 
There are exam unfortunately, there are examples out there. So the duty of care then is for board members being informed, making decisions based on material that you are being provided and that you're asking for that material as well that you feel that you need. You have to exercise independent judgment and act in good faith, be honest. And actually how you do these things, there's a process to it and it's, it's not complicated, but uh, surprisingly not everyone adheres to this, attend meetings. Uh, it's important to be present at the table. Request information if you don't have enough uh, to make a decision. Chris mentioned this, I'm gonna say it. I ask a lot of questions. I probably ask too many questions sometimes on boards that I've been on, but uh, so they have to be reasonable questions, but make sure that you aren't sitting there uh, uncertain of something and feel that you know you can't ask a question because nine times out of 10, other people have the same question. And then there's the common sense rule. Uh, and it's, a, it's really kind of a business judgment rule that, that we should take comfort in as, as board members, which is as long as you've been engaged and you've been asking questions and you've been involved in it and you have records and documentation that show that these deliberations have happened, you can uh, survive a bad decision because we can't always make good decisions but we have to make them based on something solid. And it, lacking that, you are open to criticism and perhaps even some legal uh, responsibility if you're really making decisions in an uninformed manner. Um, so that's, that's important. But another important point is to, once a decision is made by the board, uh, to support that decision. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do that when, you've hold, when you hold an opposing point of view. And I'll give you an example, uh, this public information, but in terms of Rochester, a couple of years ago, we went through this whole planning process to develop a, what we called Reimagine RTS, which was a reconfiguration of our service in a couple of different ways. Uh, frequent service, 15 minute service on 10 of the 30 routes that we had on-demand service in certain zones of the county that were underserved with fixed transit, but we felt we could provide an on-demand alternative to that. So we were all ready to go with this decision that we made uh, based on you know, retreats that we had and planning sessions. And lo and behold, the city school district in Rochester faced a crisis of transportation of their students. Uh, this was about two years ago when we were launching our Reimagine. And you know, we have a limited supply of buses, a limited supply of drivers. And the board was faced with a decision that they had to make under pressure from the governor to uh, divert uh, some of the improvements that we were going to make into meeting this basic need of getting city school kids to their uh, high schools. Doing it in a way that's legal, by the way, Chris will be happy to know that the routes are open to the public, uh, but nonetheless, they go to the schools and they had to increase the number of buses that were available to do that. Well, I had a lot of problems with that. Um, we had made the decision to reimagine uh, our system and now we're being faced with an external crisis that required a new decision to be made by the board. But, uh, and, I, and I argued that, are we here to serve the general public or are we here to serve specific groups within that in terms of school children? The decision was to meet the needs of the school children because that was critical for their academic success, obviously, to get to school and also to support uh, children in our city. So once that decision was made, I had to be um, you know, faithful to that decision and support that decision. And that's just an example of a collaborative decision-making process that you have the opportunity to, to express your opinions about things, but in the end, even if the decision isn't one that you voted for, uh, a good functioning board, a collaborative board is gonna support it, um, you know, the final decision that's made. Uh, duty of loyalty um, and good faith. Uh, <clears throat> here is where we get into issues like conflict of interest that uh, prohibiting uh, people from uh, board members from seeking personal financial benefits. Um, by being on a board and disclosing those uh, interests uh, through a, a transparent process, which is usually, you know, by declaring on, a, on an annual form that's completed on a conflict of interest form. 
And, you know, having a conflict is not a fatal flaw to be on a board. Um, the failure is not disclosing it. And the failure is to, if you were to participate in a decision where your interests are involved, that's a flaw. But if you declare your conflict and not vote on matters where there's a conflict, that that's usually viewed as a very acceptable way to deal with that. Because, you know, in some communities, if you prohibited board members from being on a board because they might have a conflict in all these different areas, whether it's insurance sales or product sales or HR services or whatever it might be, <clears throat> you, would, it, you might have a hard time finding somebody to be on the board. Um, the other thing is it's sort of like going to Vegas. What happens in a boardroom stays in a boardroom. Uh, and, um, you know, our meetings are public, so they're uh, filmed and open to the public. We can't have a meeting that, it, that is held behind closed doors where there's a group of board members discussing something. So that helps in terms of the transparency part. Um, I want to say that, you know, you can't serve two masters when you're on a board. A lot of times people are like, well, I'm on this board representing X constituency. And it's true, you're, you may be able to reflect that voice of that constituency, but uh, you have to be faithful to the entity that you are on the board of, that that's who you serve and that's uh, who your loyalty um, has to be with. Um, the duty of, of oversight, uh, we've talked a little bit before and we'll be talking more uh, tomorrow, but. Uh, again, what does this mean? It means monitoring the activities of management and staff. It means providing policy direction consistent with the mission. Uh, and if you have uh, legislation that has created your, your body, your, your organization. And here it's important to avoid mission creep with new programs uh, where sometimes something may seem attractive to get into, but is it really consistent with your, with your mission? And um, you have to defer from that. Now, sometimes you may, uh, some organizations create subsidiary, subsidiary organizations, even for-profit arms in some instances, uh, to whether it's a foundation or et cetera. We have a couple of foundations at, at the regional transit system, but they're not inconsistent with the mission of, of, of what we do. You, everyone knows that, that board members uh, develop and approve policies. Uh, and many of those policies are required by law. So you are really incumbent on you to know and be informed about what are the laws. And sometimes they're changing all the time in the case of uh, HR policies. Uh, but uh, even though the state or the feds may say, you have to do this in terms of, of an HR policy, you still need to incorporate it into your policy manual and you still need the board to approve that uh, in terms of its application um, you know, to your entity. <clears throat> and typically boards uh, set an amount of money where they would allow staff to purchase goods and services, capital items, uh, without getting board approval. And there's a couple ways you can do this. One is by setting an amount that is uh, low enough not to get you into a lot of trouble, but also high enough that you're not uh, getting a, an agenda filled with a gazillion different purchase items. Uh, so, for example, some of the range is typically seventy-five to one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. It probably depends on your organization, uh, and and I think we're about one hundred twenty-five now. But uh, the exception to that is if there's a procurement that's done through state contract, where it's already been bid out and followed state procurement policies, uh, where we become aware that that was purchased off state contract, we still approve that purchase off state contract but the uh, rigmarole that the management has to go through to uh, enable that or purchase that or enable that contract um, is already really kind of taken, by, taken care of by the state procurement policies. Overseeing internal controls and uh, overseeing the activities of the uh, external auditors. Um, so you should meet with the auditors, you should have an audit committee. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But when you meet with the auditors, um, you should meet with them separate from management. And I think most people are aware of that and do that now because you really want to have a confidential, open, you tell me what's going on. Uh, you know, that can be an executive session, by the way. That doesn't have to be open to the public. That is allowable to do some of those uh, meetings uh, in executive session. Uh, you really want to get the truth about, you know, how are the books? How are their internal control processes? Uh, 
are the statements accurate that we've been getting? And that, that's a responsibility of all board members, not just the finance committee folks. Uh, but um, it becomes then, how do we shift into uh, management oversight um, in general? And what does that mean? It means that we ensure that the agency's conduct is legal. You know, it was mentioned before, don't do anything illegal uh, and don't do anything immoral either. Uh, make sure that you're ethically appropriate. Uh, it's your job to provide active oversight of the management and make the reasonable inquiries about activities where appropriate. And um, you don't have to get in the weeds, but on you know big items, how's it going for recruitment? Uh, what what are we doing to get drivers to deal with this process? How you know what are some ideas that we can talk about to help management do that? Um, it's also important to support management, not just view view that oh we have to review them and do a performance evaluation, but you really want to have a good relationship with your CEO and your executive team because they're the they're the doers, they're the implementers, and uh, you have to have trust with them and, and have a good positive relationship. Uh, obviously, hiring the chief executive and, and, and evaluating their performance is one of the fundamental uh, roles of the board, of a board, <clears throat> and quite honestly, Boards often fall short on that. They're, they let it go, they let it lapse. Sometimes a board, uh, I'm sorry, an executive director will be like, gee, it's been a year and a half since I've had my review. Uh, come on board, what's going on here? Um, so it's important to stay on top of that. And I have some examples of that that uh, will be available online, a tool that we use to evaluate our uh, CEO on an annual basis. And the form is created and you adjust it every year. So it's kind of a no brainer, but you have to implement it and have all the board members. In our case, we have all the board members fill out this evaluation. Understanding the difference between um, oversight and meddling, uh, the chief executive is totally responsible for implementation of policies and strategies and oversight of staff. Uh, the oversight of staff, you know, that gets tricky for some board members because they're like, oh, I don't like that person or I don't think that person is doing a good job or we need to get rid of that person. And you really have to be careful with that. I remember when I was a CEO of the transportation, the nonprofit transportation agency had a board, of course, and the board chairman at the time talked to me about we're not really too happy with the financial reports that we're getting. You know, what's going on with your CFO uh, and is he really suitable for the job? And so I gave that some thought and I ended up making a change, but I didn't make the change because I was ordered to do it. I made the change because the board member helped me sort of understand and see that, gee, there really is kind of a problem here. And that's okay. It would be inappropriate for the board member to come in and, and criticize the CFO in that case, say that they wanna evaluate them or order the CEO to do something. Except, of course, if there's something that's illegal or immoral that has happened, then you may have to step in as a board member. But you really have to, you know, take the advice of board members. But you, as the executive, in the case of management, makes the final decision on staff. So board members should not be meddling in how the director runs his or, or her organization. But the management has an obligation to keep the board informed on sufficient information around what are issues of concern, what are the risks of, that the organization is facing, what are the liabilities, because all of that, it's not a question of shame by the CEO, it's uh, a question of getting help uh, and, and having the board be able to deliberate and maybe come up with some solutions, uh, make some intelligent decisions. Uh, that gets into, of course, uh, financial oversight, which is gonna be a subject tomorrow, but. It is part of the governance responsibility, so I want to touch on it briefly here, um, that it is one of the major responsibilities of the board and uh, um, that, that to oversee the financial uh, condition of the organization. They need to understand what, what it is. It's good to know uh, the funding sources uh, that we've talked about uh, and what they're buying with those funding sources, what programs are provided through those funding sources and uh, that they should get regular financial uh, reports monthly, really, if you're meeting monthly at, at a board meeting. And when you get those reports, um, don't let your eyes gloss over, but look at the detail, ask questions about it, uh, and make your own decisions. Because you, 
ultimately, you know, the board is responsible to approve a budget, both a capital budget and an operating budget. And uh, I know the board that I'm on, we don't always rely just on management's recommendation when it comes to some budget areas. And then we want to know how the agency's performing compared to what that approved budget was. And so adjustments can be made um, if they need to. Um, how many board committees should there be when you talk about governance? Uh, it really, you know, there's people that say less is better, uh, more gets too complicated and burns people out. It also depends on the size of your board, depends maybe on the size of your organization. Uh, sometimes it depends on the size of the budget, but not always. Uh, I had more committees with running a nonprofit that was in the 10 to $15 million range budget versus the transit authority that I'm on the board of that has about $120 million budget uh, and we have less committees. And those committees that we have are basically, we have executive committee members, we have governance committee, we have the compensation committee um, and we have the audit committee. And sometimes, and they work together, I'm chair of the governance committee. And you know when we were replacing our CEO, the governance committee came up with what should the process be to do that? But then it, it went over to the compensation committee who actually uh, acted to um, replace the CEO of the selection committee and interview committee. So they do work together. Um, compensation committee determines how much are you gonna pay the CFO and executive officers uh, and is involved in succession planning, as I just mentioned. The audit committee obviously oversees accounting and financial reporting processes financial statements, sometimes they're combined. Uh, the audit might even be combined with an investment committee because boards have some responsibility that some, they have responsibility to determine how should any surplus funds, not profits, but surplus funds be invested if, if you have them. I'm gonna focus on the governance committee though, uh, specifically uh, today, of course, and there, <clears throat> These uh, purposes are taken from our charter and I, of the committee. And I, I, I recommend, this isn't the case in a lot of boards, but having a charter for every committee um, is, is work to create it, but it provides a kind of guidance to the members of the committee in terms of what's the purpose of the committee? How does it function? What is its authority and responsibilities? How frequently should it meet? Who should be in it? What is it comprised of? Uh, so. So having committees and clarity about the purpose of them are important. As far as governance go, um, generally speaking, we say we want to keep our board informed of best of practices um, and uh, reviewing industry governance trends. And that's where CTAA is so important, has been important to me as a member because we become aware of trends through CTAA. And uh, for example, fair policies, uh, you know, we the previous session talked a little bit about fares. I'm someone who's raising that question uh, on our board uh, in terms of an upcoming retreat. Uh, what are the pros and cons of having fares and should we consider getting rid of them? We've held our fares to a dollar uh, for, for one um, ticket for one ride uh, and to $56 for an unlimited monthly ride pass. For years now, we haven't changed it. But when I ride the bus, I see some people struggling to come up with even that. And I wonder, knowing who we serve and the population that's using our service, would we be able to get more ridership by eliminating fares? And would that be offset by any kind of revenue that we might get uh, in terms of mileage and passenger rides? And we, we provide about 8 million rides a year. I, I don't know if I mentioned that. So that would be one. On-demand service, we did a lot of study on that in terms of uh, trends in the community, uh, the industry about that um, to look at it, and we implemented that. Zero emissions is a big one. Uh, we're kind of leading the, the pack in some ways in New York State, in Rochester. We have electric, but well, we have diesel buses. We have vehicles that are uh, gasoline, unleaded fuel. We have electric buses now. We have 20 of those, and we decided this climate isn't going to work. So now we're going into hydrogen cell uh, buses as well. So it's like, uh, you know, um, sometimes you, you are a pilot for other entities, but sometimes you can learn from other 
providers, other transit systems, you know, in our in our industry, what worked for you, what didn't work for you, and and why. Uh, another uh, role for the governance committee, and this gets a little tricky depending on your situation, but to advise um, applicable governmental bodies who are responsible for appointing the director, uh, what are you looking for? What do you what what would be a skill set that that might be helpful to have? <clears throat> we have a you know variety of skill sets on our board. The challenge for us is that each of the member counties, the, the city and the county, in the case of our authority, Rochester appoints or recommends to the governor people to be on the board, and then the counties, the member counties do the same. The governor really decides they have to get two options. She decides who's going to be on the board, and then it has to be approved by the Senate. That's a lot more complicated than, say, a nonprofit transportation agency where typically the board itself is the membership that elects or the authority that elects a board member. So this idea is still the same between the two, which is what are we looking for? What skills do we need? What representation do we need uh, to be on the board? And then finally, uh, the governance committee is responsible to uh, formulate proposed policies for honest and ethical conduct. And examples would be, you know, conflict of interest policy, whistleblower policies, appeals processes. And uh, all of these different policies are kept, are assigned to be kept. <laughs> you know, somebody's got to keep track of it on the staff level uh, because, you know, you get into all kinds of policies around code of ethics, compensation committee, planning, uh, debt policy, um, audit committee charters, all of the charters. So it's important to have staff assigned to monitor these policies. And every year uh, there's a quick review by staff and the, and the governance committee, you know, are these policies still good? Are they still relevant? Do we need to make any changes? And, you know, you do rely on legal counsel for, for a lot of that uh, and, and knowledgeable people on staff to do that, depending on the size of your organization. But that's an important um, uh, work for the governance committee. I should also say that not on here is informing and advising the CEO regarding community risks and opportunities is, is an important obligation, I think, of boards and governments. So let's, I want to talk a little bit about some of the practices that we have <clears throat> uh, that, um, I, that have been very useful. And really, on the many boards that I've been on, uh, and I don't get paid to say this by Rochester, but I think we, we have uh, really some good best practices in place right now. And some of it is, you know, kind of common sense, but do you really do it? For example, the annual performance review of the CEO, <clears throat> I have a sample that you'll be getting that, that includes, you know, what are the kind of questions you ask uh, to evaluate the CEO in terms of uh, his performance, you know, things like how do they, how does he relate to the board? How does he uh, manage things financially? Um, how does he, is he good in terms of his leadership and development of the management team? Does he have a good relationship with the communities that we serve? Does he have a good relationship with the board itself? You know, does it, is, 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 it's, in our case, it's a he. Does he exceed expectations, meet them, need improvement? or I don't have enough information to answer the question. That's an option for board members. Want to know, you know, are, are we results oriented? Do we have good goals? Are we really willing to take risks and foster innovation and creative thinking? Again, I mentioned earlier on, you know, there's a risk aversion sometimes with boards. Got to be careful about that because you want to be able to take risks because we have to always be moving forward in terms of what our plans are and how we're meeting the community's needs. What's the work ethic of the, of the uh, CEO and so on. So I'm not gonna go through all of them, but there's about 20 some areas and then there's opportunity for overall comments to make. Also, and this is something that I had never done on a board is an annual self-assessment of the board itself. Every board member you know, is asked to complete a not terribly long, but still relevant a survey of themselves. Do they feel that they understand the mission of the organization? Do they feel like they're getting all of the financial information they need? Does the CEO communicate with them? You know, do they are they involved in planning, and so on? So I have an example of that, and I and we use the self-assessment results 
uh, where people say, ah, you know, I'm not really sure what this means that I'm supposed to, you know, uh, represent the authority in the community. I don't know what that means. So if a lot of, if even one or two people say that, we then uh, consider, you know, some training for the board on that or part of our annual retreat, which by the way, we have an annual retreat. And this retreat is an opportunity and a day long thing, have it a good place that has good food and good refreshments and comfortable seats, uh, bring in outside speakers that can talk about some of these trends for example, zero emissions, uh, what's going on there or other uh, mobility issues that are new in the community <clears throat> and really delve into those, the opportunity for the board to set some goals and strategies uh, for the future and then assess that retreat. Was it helpful? What did people say about that? And then finally provide recommendations for the board on uh, using all of that, how we can orientate new board members better to improve their performance and what and be clear about what the expectation of board members are. And then we have a charter for the governance committee. I included a sample that will be online of our charter for uh, that, that, as I said before, kind of lists what are the purposes, what are the things that the committee should be looking at um, and doing. So these are kind of simple stuff, but they, I'm, at least in my case, not, not often practiced in a lot of the boards. Um, and also, you know, having performance measures. We spend a lot of time talking about uh, this. And in fact, we have a system called the TOP system, which is our, our word for that is a transportation organization performance scorecard. And every month we get a report from the CEO at our board meeting in terms of these four strategic pillars. Where do we stand? Financial sustainability, which ultimately is, you know, uh, where are we on net income? Uh, you know, it's the bottom line issue, right? Are we going to have a deficit? Are we going to have a surplus? Are we on target with the budget? So uh, these are all weighted and they change over the course of the year in terms of what might be highlighted more than others. Uh, because when you do customer satisfaction measurements and net pr uh, promoter scores and onboard customer surveys, we don't do that every quarter. We do that, I think, twice a year. Uh, so that reaches a higher level of, of percentage concern depending on when they were done. We've decided that uh, on-time performance is one of the key measurements for our, our public transit system. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more briefly about what that means, but that's one of the pillars uh, for our uh, uh, top scoring or strategic pillar. And then the fourth one is employee engagement and satisfaction. Are they uh, involved? We offer many activities for our employees. Are they engaged in them? Uh, what do they value in them? Uh, and also surveying them, what is important to them? And you know, we're, we're learning as you all are, who are either management or board members, burnout is becoming a big issue. Uh, it isn't always about pay. Pay is pretty good. You know, benefits are, tend to be good in public sector transit but not always, people could argue about that, but sometimes what's more important is the work environment, the stress that they're under uh, in terms of deadlines and shortage of drivers and if there's equipment issues, et cetera. So it's important, those are the four pillars that we at a very high level, you know, we think are important, but then we also have uh, more than this, but these are just some samples of some service goals that the board uh, as approved and sometimes says, I wanna hear more about this one or that one or add this one or that one. What does it mean to be on time? You gotta define these goals in terms of how you're gonna measure it. And we get a lot of data. There's a lot of ways to, to track data in a transit system. And, and, but you have to know what you're tracking and what does it mean to be on time? Uh, so we define that, you're not too early, not too late. And, and we want to meet that 88% of the time. We, we exceed that, by the way, uh, that goal of 88% on time performance. And we're in the 90s in some of our properties or some of our counties, even higher or lower than, uh, than 98%. You know, being too early is a problem in transit. Having clean buses, not passing up customers too much in terms of, you know, if there's a, a lot of people at a bus stop and your bus is full, those are the good old days and a lot, a lot of times, but do you have another bus that's coming within five minutes to pick up that overflow? 
or are you passed up and left people stranded? And when you don't have frequent service, this is a very big issue. And like I said, we have some routes with 15 minute service and some we don't yet, but I hope we get back to that. Missing trips, like if uh, the whole route is missed, driver doesn't show up, bus breakdown, whatever it might be, one leg either from the transit center to the end of the run or from the end of the run back to the transit center. We obviously have a very small percentage of where that occurs. <clears throat> and then we do surveys in terms of customer service by bus operators and then net promoter scores for customer service itself for those. Uh, we hire outside entities to do these customer surveys and onboard um, surveys and interviews. So let me uh, just end with um, saying that I'm grateful I've been able to move the, the slides uh, through the whole thing and not get jammed up like I did in the beginning. But um, being a director on a board is not an, uh, just something that you do to build your resume or because it's, you know, oh, look at me. It's really a real job and it's an important job. And we do it because it makes a difference in our community and uh, good governance leads to good service and good management and good results, uh, I think. So that is my story. And uh, if anyone wants to contact me, um, that's my email. Hey, th thanks, Bill. And uh, you may have had a couple of issues with the slides, but this is going to be a uh, a Zoom meeting where no one, knock on wood, has had to do the. Oh, you're on mute. So you know we've done we've done well. Um, yes. and, and a lot of good information. Um, a couple of questions that I, I wanted to share with you. I know that uh, Kristen, who's going to be teaching tomorrow, has been answering some of these. And thank you, Kristen. We appreciate that. Um, one person asked, you know, what kind of you mentioned a couple of committees. Um, but what are other typical or common committees beyond just executive and finance? Sure. You, know, you mentioned yeah. governance. Are there any others? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned, you know, governance, compensation, audit. But, uh, but other ones that are typical are a finance committee, for example, that, that is called a finance committee and meets monthly. Our, we don't have a finance committee. We have an audit committee uh, and we get the finance report. So a finance committee. Some people have program committees where they get reports on a day on a monthly basis or or less frequently. You know what are the services that are going on? Uh, some have strategic planning committees uh, that that only that function at certain times of the year. The governance committee in our case operates as really the strategic planning committee because we organize the retreat and the development of that plan. The plan, which is created every year, by the way updated every year in our system. HR committee, sometimes, uh, <clears throat> you know, transit systems will have a separate committee for that. Um, so it really, you know, it's varied. And I was kind of surprised we only had a few. Uh, and I've heard people say you should have less rather than more, but I think you should have what you think you need uh, for good government. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, every system is going to be a little different, but as long as those committees are serving and I liked your idea that you shared about having a charter that really speaks to purpose um, as long as they're serving an effective purpose and, and effectively then then they're probably good. Uh, one participant was particularly interested in the um, uh, assessing workforce satisfaction that you're doing at RTS. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Um, and and the way you see the role of the board in being informed about overall employee satisfaction yeah i think it's i think it's critical for the board to be informed of that and find out how is the morale of the organization you know what are the issues around that um i know that uh you know a lot of it has to do with um you know uh, some of the some of the activities are physical in nature like providing outlets we have a like a gym on on board to engage employees for physical health. Uh, people want to know if they're getting if they're getting support from HR, if they have a problem, whether it's a personal problem or um, you know, an issue with pay or an issue with benefits, that those are being handled correctly. Work environment, the values of the organization, how they are treating one another, are there conflicts? Uh, getting a sense of that and are there, like we have a different, um, 
uh, events for employees. It could be a film on uh, a particular uh, issue or event and then getting feedback from them. So we get, um, what we get at the board level though, are just some high level metrics about, you know, what has been the percentage of engagement. And, and there's been times in, not, in, in the recent past where that satisfaction has dropped and we've been trying, that's where it gets into the burnout issue. Uh, so we get feedback on that. So um, I can get more information on, you know, what exactly they're asking employees, but I know generally we're interested to know uh, are they engaged in these things? Are they satisfied or not satisfied with the job? And if not, yeah. why not? You know, and I'd encourage the uh, participant to email you directly um, uh, for, for further yeah. information. Um, yeah, happy to get that. One thing that you, you kind of mentioned, but I think bears repeating, and one of our participants added a chimed in with, I thought, which was a really good comment, which is this notion that all boards need to completely agree all the time and that everything has to be unanimous. And one of our, one of our participants said, um, you know, for, 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 for this person, the real issue is, is not that everybody agrees, but that everybody's heard, which I think is a nice way of saying that an appropriate way of saying that. Sure. What are your thoughts on, you know, useful friction in boards? Yeah, I think I think debate and differing opinions is pretty critical. Um, you know, when we were looking for a uh, succession policy, uh, this is a small example, but in the governance committee or and even in the full board, there are some people that felt very strongly that we needed to do a national search versus uh, an internal candidate. That's a small example, but uh, I gave you uh, and and over time and over discussion you know, people came to a consensus that we we're gonna allow for um, an internal candidate without doing a national search and, and understood why we were in favor of doing that because we had a good succession planning process in place and why put people through the expense and hassle of coming in for interviews if you really know you have the person uh, that you want <clears throat> and, and, you know, that it's legal to do that, by the way, you're not obligated to do yep. a national search. Yep. But some people felt like, well, we need to do it because we're a public agency and it looks better. So that's a small example of it. Sometimes we have fight, not fights, but differences about what right. should the compensation be? What should the service be? You know, should we do the school service or should or shouldn't we? You know, healthy, healthy, respectful dialogue around yeah. issues where yeah. board members are expressing their opinions and representing quote unquote their constituents, constituencies. Right. That that's that's a hallmark of a functioning effective board. Exactly. You don't want a rubber stamp board either for the CEO or for the president. You know, if the president says we do it this way, you really want to have a collaborative uh, consensus building approach. And that's why when the final decision is made and the final vote is taken, you're not going to get people to accept the result if they haven't had that opportunity, if they haven't felt that they've been heard, uh, and, if they, and if they haven't listened to the other side as well. So I think it's good to have disagreement. Uh, but what you don't want to do is push that out into the community and show, you know, a dysfunctional board uh, per se. Correct. Your, your Las Vegas approach. Uh, another question. What about when a board member uh, feels strongly that they are only on the board to serve a very specific and sometimes um, uh, very uh, uh, limited interest of a community they represent versus the system? which you kind of spoke to, how do, you, how, how do you see that being managed effectively? Yeah, you know, uh, that's such a good point. And that's such a good question because a lot of times we get on boards thinking that's why we're on the board. And, and, and that's true to some degree because, you know, we may represent a certain constituency. But the, but the key here is that as a board member, your responsibility is to that organization ultimately. It's not to where you're coming from. It's to that organization. So um, you, can, you can advance uh, in discussions, you know, the interests of that constituency group, but in the end, you know, your obligation is to the, to the entity. So for example, you couldn't, uh, it would be wrong for you to say, well, we need to do this no matter what the cost. Uh, you know, we need to serve this area or this group 
no matter what it costs and you don't have the money to do it. And it's a bad financial decision. Um, uh, but you feel like you have to stick to your guns because that's who you are. No, you're there to see if you can accomplish the interests, you know, address those stakeholder interests, but also understanding that it has to be within the kind of your obligation to the transit agency itself. Yeah, no, thank you, Bill. And Chris, uh, our previous presenter uh, notes that on a board he served, they would wrap up debates on contentious issues with discussion on um, uh, how to discuss these issues with our membership in the community served and being sure to honor the board decision, even if folks don't like it and make sure that it's not just kind of a vote and run away strategy, which I think is as well a good board. Last piece that I wanted to remind folks of uh, based on what Bill had to say, because he mentioned it quickly, is board members should ride their systems every now and again and know what, you know, you're, you're charged with, with a leadership role in a rural, an urban, a, 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 an entity providing mobility. You need to see it, feel it un, to best understand it. So I think good board members periodically, if not regularly, ride the systems too. Absolutely. And, you know, in New York, we have a, a new policy where transit systems have a person representing the disabled community on our board as a voting member. We used to have it as a non-voting member. <clears throat> and that, that's really important and that's valuable, but every board member has to understand how the system works, not just for one group or the other, older adults in my case, you know, I'm interested in that. And, um, and we've done some good policy changes as far as reduce fares all the time for older adults, not just off peak because a lot of older adults work. Um, but, you know, um, it's good. It, it's just really good to have board members. And this is a this is a negative. This is really a weakness when board members don't know what services right. are provided by their agency. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bill. Great session. Great information. Again, we'll be sharing this with everyone. Uh, and also, again, we will have the, the, the closed captioning or the captioning working tomorrow uh, as we set up. We'll get that set. Um, ask those questions of the emails of, of me and others. Uh, make sure that you, you, this becomes time well spent for you. Um, all, tomorrow, we will start again at 4 o'clock Eastern time. Same link. We'll get you right in. The two sessions we're going to be doing tomorrow are improving board financial literacy, which is going to be a really good deep dive on that financial oversight piece, and, and I think an important aspect of what we're doing. And then um, we're going to do a session on succession planning. Bill was talking about his experience doing that. Um, and I know some of our board members that are out there, that is a something right in front of them right now that they're that they're working with. So I think we'll we'll get to, to some good discussion on that. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, I appreciate, Don, the kind comment that you found this helpful. Um, we look forward to seeing you all back here again at four o'clock tomorrow. So with that, be safe and have a good evening.